Welcome everyone to another reaction video and today I'm stepping out of my historical comfort zone. I've been promising for a while that we would get to something that was outside of what I knew about which is mainly uh, American history and European history. So we're diving in today to uh, Extra Credits, uh, Extra Histories, Simon Bolivar. I don't know how many episodes there are, but uh, this is number one, so there's at least two. Uh, so I'm excited to do this, and I'll say up front, uh, I don't know a lot about this. So my reaction is going to be much more about um, learning. Uh, and you guys said you were okay with that, so hopefully you are. Uh, I'll offer what I can when I can in my observations, but I'm here to learn. And if any of you know more about this topic, please feel free to use the comment section below and let us know your thoughts about all of this. Please don't forget to subscribe and don't forget to check out the original content. I'll put a link in the description to the original video. Let's dive in. Shots ring out in the Ohio Valley. A handful of militiamen under the command of a 22-year-old named George Washington have surrounded a tiny force of French colonials. Within two years, due to the interwoven alliances and secret treaties, this incident will spiral out into the Seven Years' War. The first truly world war, a war that would be fought on every continent besides Australia. And pretty much started by George Washington. Uh, it's fascinating, and I've actually done a visit to a couple of the places associated with this, which are down around, not too far from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, one of them is uh, Fort Necessity. Uh, where Washington lost and had to surrender when he was surrounded. And then the other one is the site of Braddock's defeat. And I'll put links in the description to those videos down below. And the dominoes fall. But as important and mind-bogglingly understudied as the Seven Years' War is, we're going to just look at one of its repercussions, because its reverberations were felt around the globe. This was the great conflagration between England and France. It was the conflict that had to happen eventually. But here in the States, we know it under a different name. We know it as the French and Indian War. And to be honest, growing up, and I was a guy who loved history, so I paid more attention to these things than a lot of my classmates did. Growing up, I had no idea that there was more to the war than the French and Indian War, because that's all we learned about. We didn't realize it was part of a larger global war that was happening in Europe and in Africa and in other places. We just knew it as the French and Indian War, because that was the part we were involved in, and we Americans tend to only care about what we're involved in, which is ridiculous, but it's the way it is. We know it as such because that's the war we Americans fought, but we didn't fight it alone. We were still a British colony back then, and the British sent thousands of troops overseas to help fight back the French forces coming out of Canada. By 1763, the war was over and peace had returned, but with peace comes taxes. After all, someone had to pay for all of those troops Britain had sent over. But a number of colonists didn't much like the idea of higher taxes, and they felt that the Boston Harbor really would be much better if it was tea-flavored. So, they rebelled against the British. Yeah, and honestly, as an American, trying to speak as objectively about this as I can, um, we overreacted to this. I don't think it was unreasonable at all uh, to have to pay taxes to have paid for a war that was largely fought on our shores uh, to defend our property, our interests. Um, you know, the main issue, of course, was taxation without representation. But let's say the uh, colonies had had been given representation in Parliament. It wouldn't have changed anything. The vote still would have uh, been to levy these taxes. They wouldn't have had the votes to change it. So really, this was just an excuse to break free. They were led by a 44-year-old man named George Washington. Some relation. Now, those plucky colonists gave a good try of it, but they couldn't really throw off the world's greatest power without some help. Yep. So, the world's other great powers, who wanted to give Britain a kick in the pants, mainly the French and the Spanish, said, Hey, that looks fun. Mind if we join? But now someone was going to have to pay for all those supplies and troops the French and the Spanish sent over to the Americans. So, the French and the Spanish both implemented new taxes, both at home and, most importantly for our story, in their colonies overseas. And isn't it interesting, again, we talk about this all the time, how each event of history is not in a vacuum. It's connected to the things that come before and come after it. Without the French and Indian War... There's no American Revolution. Without the American Revolution, there's probably no French Revolution. And without all these dominoes falling, you can see then without the French Revolution, there's no Napoleonic Wars. Without the Napoleonic Wars, there's probably no World War I and everything else that happens in between. 
So then the French revolted, and then the Haitians revolted, and then most of Latin America revolted, because they, understandably, didn't feel like paying higher taxes just to, well, help make sure the US didn't have to pay their higher taxes. Because in the end, it all comes down to taxes. So there, now the stage is set. Now we can dive into the life of the man who embodies both the glory and the tragedy of the Latin American revolutions, Simon Bolivar. 1783. We're in one of the great houses of Caracas. On the lower floor, there's a celebration happening. All the leading people of the city are there. In the center is a man with eyes like a still lake, talking to the crowd. Upstairs, things are quiet. There's a woman lying in bed, holding a newborn child. The man is Simon's father, the woman is his mother. Soon, they'll both be taken by consumption. Hmm. Wow. Simon would not remember his father, and he would think of his mother less often than of the slave who raised him, Hippolyta. Simon wow. inherited mines and plantations and slaves. The Bolivars were one of the first families of Venezuela, and he one of the richest men in South America. But he wasn't a man yet, he was a child. And there was one thing that he didn't have, Spanish birth. In the Spanish colonial system, there were not only all sorts of deplorable hierarchies of race, but even for those deemed racially pure and white, there was a class system, with those born in continental Spain being more favorably looked upon than those born in the colonies. And I think that was, yeah, I remember studying some of that when it came to Mexico. Uh, so it makes sense that that's the case uh, down in South America as well. You have some of the same issues happening. And you have to wonder if this class system, system hadn't been in place, if people born in the Western Hemisphere could have the same standing as those born in Spain, how things might have been different. Maybe there wouldn't have been as much of a cause to rebel. The highest government offices were only open to Spanish-born colonists. But this bane wouldn't strike him yet. Instead, he grew up as an unmanageable and arrogant child. His father had died when he was three, his mother when he was nine. The care of those in which he was left was sometimes excellent, sometimes negligent, but it didn't matter. He was always more interested in coursing the alleys of Caracas with the children of the streets than he was in studying or guidance. Finally, though, one tutor, while never able to control him, was able to teach Simon, albeit on his own terms. And so, as they rode through the fields or walked the streets of Caracas, this tutor imparted not a traditional education, but his own personal loves. Rousseau, Locke, and Voltaire. Hmm. Alas, even this was not to last, as Simon's childhood was set to a backdrop of revolts. Venezuela, and indeed the whole Spanish Empire, was in upheaval. Race revolts and independence movements cropped up and were crushed, each time with more brutality, but each time exposing Spain's ever-slipping hold. Simon's tutor was caught up in one of these revolts and sentenced to permanent exile. And so, again, Simon was alone. Soon he was enrolled in the local military academy by an uncle. He chafed at the discipline, but learned much about the art of making war. Soon, though, he was shipped off again, this time to Spain. Hmm. But he wanted this adventure. He was excited to see the continent that he'd heard so much about, the place where the ideas he so admired came from. But even on this trip, he got a taste of the declining nature of Spanish power. For when his ship stopped in Mexico City, they were informed that they wouldn't be able to depart right away because of a British blockade. <laughs> Eventually, though, he did make it to Spain, and then on to Madrid, where he would finally get his first real education. So this is all very interesting. So the guy's got a, a background of wealth uh, in his family, but not necessarily privilege as... Uh, the wealth is great, but then he loses both of his parents, which is devastating for any kid. Um, and, and then he doesn't have the right background because he's born there rather than being born in Spain. And so he's going to have that chip on his shoulder. He's going to have that attitude. He's going to have that natural disdain for people who do have that privilege. Uh, and I'm wondering how his experience in Spain is going to shape that. And there, too, he met his first great love. Her name was Maria Teresa, and she was from another respectable Caracan family. But unlike Simon, she had been born in Spain and spent her whole life there. He soon proposed to her, and after working for a year to convince her father, they were married in Madrid. Now blissfully married, he decided it was time to return to Caracas and take his place in the family affairs together with his new wife. So they set off for the new world. For Simon, this was a return home. For Maria, it was an opportunity to see her family seat for the first time. But as they landed in Caracas, she began to feel ill, oh, geez. And then weak. Within five months, she was dead. Ugh. Yellow fever had taken Simon's first love. Ugh. He tried to stay in Venezuela to manage the life he had inherited, but everything there reminded him only of her. And I wonder how much he blamed himself for that because he brings her back 
uh, to a place she didn't grow up and she immediately gets ill. And I'm sure he had to figure it was because of that, that that happened. And so within a year, in 1803, he once again boarded a ship for Spain. But Spain too, and especially Madrid, only served as a constant reminder of Maria. So when all non-residents were suddenly ordered out of the capital because there wasn't enough bread to feed them, Simon planned a trip for Paris. There he saw an empire reinvigorated by revolution. He couldn't help mm. but contrast it with Madrid. Here was a city and a nation modernizing, evolving, growing with new republican ideals. He drank it in. He was enchanted by Paris and the promise it offered. I don't think you... <laughs> I get you're trying to set the scene that it's Paris, but there's no Eiffel Tower in Paris at this point in history. But it was here that he found his second heartbreak. Not at the hands of a woman, but of a man. Napoleon. Simon had seen Napoleon as a beacon of hope. As hmm. the new man, a true Republican serving his state faithfully. Guiding a state by his soul and humble wisdom towards liberty, equality, and brotherhood. But then Napoleon placed a crown upon his head. Uh. Losing his temper one night at a dinner, Simon railed against Napoleon's vanity, his hubris, his lust for power. This suddenly made him much less welcome in social circles. <laughs> yeah. And his and, friends, you know, he probably saw some parallels in himself and Napoleon. Napoleon's born in Corsica, uh, so he's not born in France. And so he kind of had that outsider thing going on that you're not one of us type of thing, but still rises to power anyway. Being the toll the debaucherous life of Paris had taken on him, decided that it was time for a change. They packed up and took him to Italy. Wow. And it was here, in this reinvigorating place rich with history, that Simon's thoughts and ambitions really took form. It was here on the very hill which plebeian Romans had retired to to win their rights over 2,000 years ago that Simon stood and proclaimed that he would not rest until his homeland was free. Hmm. Soon, he departed Europe to head back home. But first, he stopped briefly in the United States. Here, too, he was inspired. He would later say that it was the first time he'd seen a rational democracy in action. So he goes to Spain, France, uh, to Rome, and now to the United States. Boy, I had no idea this guy had gotten that much of uh, a background in other nations. But boy, uh, you can see how this might have inspired him to something greater, to want something more for his homeland by seeing these other nations and how things are operating and, and what their forms of government look like. And uh, he gets a glimpse of... Um, different forms of government. He sees what Napoleon becomes after the French Revolution. He gets to see what's happening in Rome. He sees a new democracy in the United States. But he realized it had its differences, that it would be no template for the revolution he intended. And so, at last, in 1807, at the age of 23, hmm. he set foot again in Caracas, filled with dreams, ambitions, and an ardent desire for liberation and independence for his people. He walked the streets of his long-neglected home, and wondered what the future might bring. Join us next time and find out exactly what that future brings. I'm excited. I, I'm, I'm curious, and I'm, I'm going to resist the temptation of going and spending all afternoon reading about this um, because I'm very curious to see uh, uh, where this story is going to go. But I really don't know. I mean, I know he's a revolutionary. I know that he leads nations to... Uh, independence from Spain, but really I don't know much else. So I'm excited. Use the comment section below and let me know your thoughts about all of this uh, and maybe fill in some of the extra uh, stuff that wasn't covered up to the age of 23 at this point in his life. But don't give us too much spoilers about what comes next because I want to uh, kind of see it for myself. So thanks for watching guys and we will see you tomorrow with the next episode.